We pray for those who are in harm's way today, especially those in areas of the world that are um, where people are suffering from war. And it just breaks my heart, God, to see the loss of life and the, especially the children dying. And uh, God, we pray that you would show us a better way to live together and bring peace to our world. That um, you'd help us be peacemakers even in our own communities. In our, even in our neighborhoods, where there's so much division and isolation, people need you, Lord, and they need us to be followers of you, and they need to see your love in us. <coughs> and God, we pray today as we open the scriptures, read about how Jesus is the suffering servant, how much... You poured, you poured your life out for us, Jesus. And we pray, God, that you live in us and help us love others and follow in your footsteps. Lord Jesus, you are a teacher, and we pray now as you taught us to pray, saying, Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. I'm sorry. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory for your channel and forever. Amen. So for the children's sermon, we don't have children today. <laughs> but I did have this thought I'll share. I think there's so much stress in our society on being on top, being the... Uh, the winner. Everybody wants to be the winner. And everybody wants to be chosen. And for for children, I think sometimes it's especially stressful because there's peer pressure and self-worth and your ego is all wrapped up in, am I going to be chosen or not? When they're dividing up teams, are they going to pick me? Will I be picked near the front? <laughs> Will I be the last one selected? There's lots of stress like that. I love sports. I've mentioned that. And I did play. I tried to play football. <laughs> I practiced football a lot. That's what I did. I practiced football. <laughs> I wasn't selected to play the game, but I was selected to practice. And it was frustrating. My dad had been a football player. He went to college. His big break was getting a football scholarship to a small college in Tennessee, the first one in his family to go to college. And he was very bright, but uh, he was had a program toward being a technical person, not a teacher like him. <clears throat> football opened doors for him. But it also was something that very early on, my dad played football, and we got football uniforms. University of Tennessee football uniforms. Go Tennessee, just beat Alabama. <laughs> so this is all part of my upbringing. And so to get to, when I was in Little League football, we had great teams, and I got to play all the time. I was a pretty good player. I got to high school, and my coach didn't think I was as good as I, I thought I was. <laughs> It was frustrating. But I, I was thinking about this yesterday. <clears throat> if, I had, if I had had a coach who said, you know, every player on this team is important. And if we don't have the people on the second string, the first string doesn't have anybody to play against in practice. You're, you're helping our team win just by being here, being present, and uh, providing someone for them to practice against. If somebody had said that, I, I would have felt like, even if I'm not playing, at least I'm contributing. Mm -hmm. Instead, I felt like I was a loser. I wasn't getting to play. I never got to play. 
My entire year, eighth grade, I played six plays on the field. And you can imagine I wasn't thrilled about trying out in ninth grade, but I did try out. And it's still more the same. Can you believe this? <laughs> I thought I'd be a great football player, like my dad. And I wasn't. <laughs> so there's pressure to perform. In today's passage, we're going to learn about how Jesus measures success. Is what kind of servant are you? What kind of servant are you? How do you go out of your way to help others? How do you follow in my footsteps? How can you contribute? It's not about being on top. It's about being part of God's mission in the world. So we're going to talk more about that. So if we'd had the kids here today, I would have asked them. No. How do you contribute? What can we do? So you're my kids today. <laughs> all right, Dad. How can we all contribute? How can we make a difference? Amen. 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 So let's stand and sing as the deer. It's 20, 25 in the faith we sing. If you want to use the black book in your pew, or it should be on the screen as well. <laughs> Doxologies, we present our tithes and our offerings to God. Good morning. 
morning. Good morning. Today's reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Look, to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief of priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him, condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him, and spit upon him, and flog him and kill him. After three days, he will rise again. James and John, the son, the son of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the bapti baptism that I'm baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as the ruler Lord, as their rulers Lord, it's over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you instead. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be the first among you must be a slave to all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Breshna, for sharing the scripture today. We've been in the Gospel of Mark. We're so thankful Mark was willing to write this gospel for us. <laughs> <laughs> Gospel Mark has three uh, themes that really stand out. And I just want to highlight some of these. One is the disciples just don't get it. <laughs> over and over, the disciples are stumbling along, bumbling, they're, they're confused, wrong things. And in this case, we see James and John looking out for themselves, trying to get ahead, trying to get prestige and honor of sitting at Jesus right and left, and the disciples just fail over and over and over. But one thing that does, it enables Mark to reiterate, to say over, this is what Jesus was trying to say, and this is how the, the disciples failed to get it, and this is what it means. You see, it was the same pattern over and over. But the disciples don't look good. Secondly, there is a sense of urgency. Over and over in the Gospel of Mark, it, it begins paragraphs with immediately, immediately, immediately they had to go do something or other. Immediately we went on a trip or this or that. Or immediately Jesus has something to say. It's over and over, so there's this sense of urgency. The Gospel of Mark is shortest of the four Gospels. It's probably the first one that was written. Definitely... The writers of the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew had a copy of the Gospel of Mark when they wrote their version of the story. In fact, some many times you'll see almost identical words in Matthew as it's recorded in the Gospel of Mark or in Luke as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. So there's this sense of urgency. The other thing that happens is that there's a turning point and in the Gospel of Mark, if you read through, you get to chapter 10, where we are now. And everything before is sort of background. 
laying the foundation. And then the attention shifts, and it's all about going to Jerusalem. We read that in today's lesson. It says that all the disciples were on the road to Jerusalem, and Jesus begins to tell them all that's going to happen to him, all the bad things that are about to happen to him. Happen to him. So again, it's this uh, urgency, but the urgency now is to move toward Jerusalem. How did the disciples react to this? Did you notice? Were they excited? We get to go to Jerusalem. They were not. They were afraid because they knew that the the authorities, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, uh, and the Roman leaders did not like, they did not trust, and they were not happy with Jesus' ministry because he was drawing huge crowds. <laughs> Many were flocking to be with him, and he was performing miracles, and people were amazed, and they were all talking about Jesus, and they were so afraid that when they got to Jerusalem, Jesus would die. What's Jesus say about all this? Verse 33 and 34 says, See, we are going to Jerusalem, Jesus says, and the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they, um, they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and they will spit upon him, and they will flog him, and they will kill him. And after three days, he'll rise again. Jesus knew. Jesus knew what was laid before him. Jesus knew when they got to Jerusalem, he would be uh, tortured and killed. Jesus knew. I think the disciples had an idea, too. That's why they were not thrilled. That's why they were not thrilled about the, uh, going now to Jerusalem, because they knew the people in Jerusalem would not be happy with Jesus would likely kill him. One of my heroes is Dr. Martin Luther King. I grew up in Atlanta. I grew up during the Civil Rights Movement. I grew up hearing um, in the period where King was spreading his message and mobilizing African American people for justice, demanding justice, and I admired him because this is a Baptist minister. <laughs> when you go down to the mall in D.C., you see all sorts of monuments to different people, our, uh, presidents especially. And right in the midst of Jefferson Memorial and the War Memorials and the World War II Memorials and the uh, Lincoln Memorial and all these in the Washington Monument, who's there? In the very middle is the monument to Dr. Martin Luther King, a whole monument with, with his words so profound. Um, I know he's not a perfect man, but I admired so much about him. One thing I admired about him was that he was a peacemaker. He believed in nonviolence. He believed in the power of love to change hearts. He said, you can't... Uh, defeat your enemies with weapons. You can only transform them with love. And, and he didn't see white people, even though they were black people were so oppressed, he didn't see white people as the enemy, but he saw them as brothers and sisters whose hearts needed to be changed. A very Christian message, right? <coughs> he knew he was going to die. Jesus knew he was going to die. I think Martin Luther King had a strong premonition that he was about to be killed. If you read his last sermon, which was, I believe, the day before he was shot, it was at Memphis, Tennessee. He was there to support. I might not, I might not make it there with you or some sort of yes. thing. Yes. I might not make it there with you. It goes like this. Like anybody. I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned with that now. 
I just want to do God's will. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. And it, it, the sermon title is, um, I've been to the mountaintop. It's exactly what you were talking about, Freshman. He knew that what he was doing would very likely end up with his death. And he didn't want to die. But it's, it seems like Jesus had the same knowledge of what lay before him. It didn't take a genius to figure this out, that if Jesus went into the central place of power, he was not going to come out alive. And it was part of what uh, God's plan to transform lives. It was all part of God's plan to transform lives. Even though it cost Martin Luther King his life, even though it cost Jesus his life, God worked that, worked through that to change our hearts and lives, right? To resurrect Christ, that Christ is alive among us, and that Christ is working in our hearts, calling us to be part of this movement of love and transformation, calling us to be part of God's work in the world, the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. All this was what Jesus was doing, right? All this what Jesus, uh, God was at work in Jesus bringing this about. So this is where it gets interesting. Jesus has just said, what's ahead for the Son of Man? He's going to be tortured and killed, and he's going to die on the cross, he'll be resurrected, all this is happening. And then James and John show up in the very next paragraph. And what do they say? Lord Jesus? Where's our you, reward? When you come into the kingdom, we want to sit on your right and on your left. On your right and on your left. Jesus had just finished talking about being killed, and it's sort of like the disciples were saying, James and John were saying, Enough of this about you. Let's talk about us. What's in it for us? <laughs> right? Jesus did have uh, three disciples who were the inner, uh, the inner group, his closest friends. The ones when he went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, who went with him? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Where's Peter? James and John are coming to ask, we won't be on your right and on your left. Where's Peter? I was with a group this week talking about this passage, and they said, James and John kind of waited till Peter had stepped away to go to the bathroom, and then they came and asked, <laughs> Jesus, we want to be on your right and left. And why did they... They limited it to just two because Jesus only had a left hand and a right hand. There's only room for two people. And Jesus said, it's not my place to choose. It's not my place to choose. But the fact is that it's the opposite. They were doing exactly the opposite of what Jesus was preaching. They weren't coming to be better servants. They were coming to promote themselves, better promoters to get in a high, exalted, honored position and have people bow down before them, like the, the kings and queens have people come and bow down and know you're the greatest. That's what they wanted, to be in that place of honor. Last week, we talked about the passage before this one, where Jesus tells about his death. Before this one, a rich, young man comes to Jesus and what does he say? He says, uh, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? What must I do? What's the bottom line, Jesus? We, I want to get in the door. Tell me what's the bottom line of what I have to do. <clears throat> it's the same pattern. It's all about me. What's in it for me? How do I get rewarded? How do I get into heaven? It's all about me. And in both cases, Jesus says, it's not about you, it's about servanthood. And he tells the rich young man, he says, what you need to do, if you want to really follow me, 
Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. Sell everything. Give it all away. Become a servant. Become a servant. And when James and John come asking for glory, honor us. What's in it for us? Make us the places of honor. Jesus says the same thing. It's not about you. It's about others. It's about becoming a servant. Becoming a servant. It's not just for them. It's a message for us. Jesus is talking to us. How can we be better servants? How can we become a servant of others? How can we follow in Jesus' example and allow him to live through us to bless the lives of others? That's what Jesus would say. He's calling us to become servants, not exalted and sitting on thrones, but kneeling at people's feet, washing their feet like Jesus did for the disciples. He's calling us to that kind of servanthood. This is what it means to follow in Christ's steps. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. And as I mentioned last week, if you feel a tug in your heart and want to come pray, as we sing, you're welcome to come and kneel at the altar and pray. Or pray where you are as we sing. Let's sing prayerfully. Together we serve. 2175 in the little black book. He's always so good. <laughs> He'll read at any last minute. And now he'll also be an act like for me. <laughs> Slides are next. Thank you, God, for this time. We pray that you go before us. As we go back into the world, that you show us how we can be your servants, how you can live in us and bless others. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.